Criterion, a name that fills cinephiles with joy and other people of the world with confusion and possibly slight annoyance. It's a group that specializes in giving some of the best films the respect they deserve, keeping old films around when the studios and executives failed to, and give them a new shine in visually restored DVDs, showing so much respect to the directors that make these films. Of course I know of Criterion. I am a white guy on the internet. I am legally obligated to know of them. And I'd say I have a... modest collection. Needless to say, whenever you see the big C at the start of any film, you know you're in for a good time. Usually. Now, art is subjective, and while one can come away from finding it deep, meaningful, and endearing, there are definitely some that make people go, what the fuck is that nonsense? And Criterion, despite its mark of quality, is no stranger to having some divisive film releases. Personally, I will never understand how Michael Bay got not just one, but two films onto the Criterion collection, and one of them is fucking Armageddon, but there is one release, one that gets people baffled at the idea that Criterion approved of this and released it. And I'm not talking about something like Godzilla All Monsters Attack, which was part of a whole ass collection, or the Cronenberg original Crimes of the Future from 1970, because going by reviews on both Letterboxd and IMDb, they got stiff competition. But I am looking solely at a full released film with its own unique box and description and such not part of a collection, and not part of the Criterion streaming service. And one that was disliked all across the board, even compared to those other two. That movie being 2013's Jellyfish Eyes. When I heard that Jellyfish Eyes was the lowest rated film by Criterion, I just looked at the cover and thought, uh, okay. So like I said before, art is subjective, it's very easy to watch something and just not understand it. There are many movies I watched once, but just didn't get. Stuff like David Lynch's Eraserhead, Juzo Itami's Tampopo, and Alejandro Jodorowsky's El Topo. All movies that at first I did not get or get the appeal of until rewatches and really thinking about it. Now I adore all of these movies, but these were three films that, despite being very hard to understand, had been praised for years. There were other films that I had heard people both loving and hating equally. Stuff like Napoleon Dynamite, Crash, The Last Jedi, Crash Again, and pretty much anything by Nicholas Venton Raffin that isn't Drive, and even then still probably Drive. But no, there was no divide with jellyfish eyes, at least in the public depiction of it. People made their grievances clear. 29% on Rotten Tomatoes, 34 critic reviews on Metacritic with a 5.6 on user reviews, 4.7 out of 10 on IMDb, 2.6 out of 5 on Letterboxd. It does have mostly positive reviews on Amazon, but Amazon reviewers are kind of batshit insane, so I wouldn't exactly take their word for it. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that this film is pretty not well liked. Now again, it's up to interpretation if this is really Criterion's worst film. There's other stuff like A Safe Place that is described as just a mess of visuals that just so happens to have Jack Nicholson in it, or The Most Beautiful, which was a Japanese imperialist propaganda film by a young Akira Kurosawa, or The Game of Death, which was notorious for not finishing with Bruce Lee alive, having to splice in a double and featured his actual for-real dead body at his actual for-real funeral, which is kind of fucked up. Uh, it's up for debate which one you could call worse, and if Jellyfish Eyes really fits as Criterion's worst. But if we look at all the reviews, it's safe to say that Jellyfish Eyes gets blown out by all of them. Well, is it the worst? Before we talk about the film, why don't we talk about the filmmaker? Jellyfish Eyes was directed by a man who, before this, was not known for his films. In fact, the man hadn't made any films before Jellyfish Eyes, this being his first, and as of the time of this video, only feature-length film, 
Directed by famous Japanese artist Takashi Murakami, he started out as wanting to work on anime and manga before developing more of a style for the finer arts, starting out with a style of Nihongo, which was a style of painting that was inspired by ancient traditional Japanese arts. After graduating, he would find himself dissatisfied with the art of Japan, calling it, in his own words, a deep appropriation of Western trends, and would use that for inspiration in his art to criticize the commercialization trends and consumer culture of Japan, with statues like Hero Pawn and My Lonesome Cowboy, which depict a large-breasted anime girl squirting milk from her breasts and a man shooting out semen and spinning it around like a lasso. As funny as these are, no, I cannot show these for obvious reasons. You'll just have to look them up yourself. But I can show you his other sculpture, Mr. D.O.B., which actually has a really cool vinyl design to it. I like it a lot. I would genuinely buy this and have it in my office. It looks really cool. He would also credit the super flat art movement in Japan, which is very hard to describe since Murakami intentionally made it limited on purpose as to not generalize it and leave room for the movement to grow. From what I could understand, it apparently is inspired by the art of anime and manga that Murakami grew up with and focuses on the post-war subculture that Japan was known for with stuff such as their heavy sexualization in their culture and their consumerism. It was such a popular movement that it even blew up in America for a time and influenced many artists in Japan, most notably Koji Morimoto, who was an animator for Akira and Mind Game and did the Beyond portion for Animatrix. He even made shirts and figures of his art in a way that was both a criticism on how art is so mass-produced and consumed, while also selling them at affordable prices while other artists sell shit at extortionist rates. The man has been doing this for a while with his own studio, which was eventually turned into Kai Kai Kiki, and made figures for stuff including movies by Studio Ghibli. He had all sorts of collaborations, including making clothes for Luis Vuitton, did the cover art for Kanye West's graduation, and animated the music video Good Morning, a music video where Kristen Dunst sang the cover of Turning Japanese by The Vapors, a music video for Billie Eilish's song You Should See Me in a Crown. He was going to work with Juice World, but he died before that could happen, and collabed with British racer Sir Lewis Hamilton, and even made his helmet. It's safe to say that Murakami had definitely done a lot outside of the film scene. He also made NFTs... Now, before I would have thought this was the man buckling to the idea of jumping on the NFT back bandwagon, which would have just been absolutely uh, disappointing, but knowing he actively sells his own art at mass-produced cheap prices, I don't know if this is his weird criticism or if he's serious. So I will just leave it at that he dabbled in NFTs for a while, and we'll just leave it there as a funny little footnote in his career. So... It's safe to say that Murakami had his hands full with all sorts of stuff, so it's no surprise that a film would eventually be something that he would want to try. And I know that you were all probably excited to get to the movie, but let's talk about the case. Look, Criterion puts a lot of effort into these little things, so let's just let's see how much work was put into this strange little thing first before we get to the meat and potatoes. So we got the cover of the film, which has these things adorning it. I have it the faintest taintest what these things are and I'm not sure how to feel about that. But what I do know how I feel is seeing the little signature on the side by Murakami himself. Criterion DVDs and Blu-rays are known for having these little signatures from the directors of the films that they approved on the collection. You usually get these nice little side pieces that adds charm, and I'm not just showing this off to show off my mass collection. Shut up! The point is, from what I could tell, the other director-approved Criterion DVDs just have their signatures, but Marukami, in his usual brand of oddness, added this little character along with his name. I just find that really charming. He didn't have to do that, but he did it anyway, and it's just really cute. The entire case is full of these strange creatures, which really does just fill me with fight or flight, honestly. There's even a lengthy pamphlet within that describes the film in full detail. It's actually quite amazing how much effort they put into this strange film and helps me get a good idea of what we're getting ourselves into. No! So I would say that the case has nice little stuff within. 
Even the menu screen is really charming in a really old school semi demo disc way with all these creatures on it, but I've put it off for long enough. What the hell is this movie and what is it about? Well, it follows a young lad by the name of Masashi as he moves into a small country town with his mother. You can forget about his mother, she's barely brought up in the entire film, same with his dead dad. There's a small conflict at the start and then it's never mentioned again. When he moves in, he stumbles upon a strange creature that he named Kuragebo, and the two become fast friends. Speaking of, the name of this creature, as there are more than just Kuragebo, they are known as Friends, and get ready for this shit, Friends is an abbreviation for Life Form, Resonance, Inner Energy, Negative Emotion, and Disaster Prevention. Fuck you, that is a terrible abbreviation, but that's just the surface level plot. You think the film is that simple, but no, it gets batshit bananas in the second half. It starts out as being a sort of diet Pokemon, no, that's giving it too much credit. It starts as a zero sugar Digimon, no, that doesn't work either. It starts as a store brand version of fighting Foodons. Yeah, remember fighting Foodons? So the film lures you in with this simple and debatably obnoxious kids film about creatures that fight. But the thing is, after a while, these fighting creatures get a little wild. And there's also some serious shit going on on the sidelines in this film for kids. Like there's a suicide and a cult and a scene where the bullies try to kill one of these cute creatures and then they sick their cute creatures to beat a kid to near death. Yeah, as it turns out, this movie just kind of goes all over the place, and it just goes hog-fucking-wild. And I am not sure how to feel about that. On the one hand, I can definitely see this being super tone-deaf and not really sure what it wants to convey. It's whimsical and funny and cute one moment, and then it just shoves in this super dark and messed up stuff near the middle. But at the same time... This was long before it was commonplace to see these fucked up horror parodies of kid stuff. I think creepypastas were just getting started in 2013, but there are so many games and videos that takes a thing made for kids and makes it evil. Well, this doesn't make it evil, it just makes it real. These are all kids with fucked up home lives, lots of trust issues, lots of messed up personal shit that they really should sort out at some point, and they are given these Pokemon creatures. Of course, they are going to use it to pick on kids and probably do some real harm. Of course, they're going to torture the other animals. Kids will always get creative with the fucked up shit that they can do to one another and to smaller creatures. This movie isn't just saying Pokemon but evil, because that's not anything. That's just so bare bones. And it isn't just making it an environmentalist message of protecting animals like whatever the hell PETA tried to do and failed. At most, this is kind of just making a jab at the consumerism of Pokemon with the way these kids are obsessed with them, wanting to upgrade them, and how one of them has an anime waifu as the summon. Oh wait, you can summon trash waifus? Nah, never mind. This isn't a Pokemon parody. This is a Shin Megami Tensei parody. Two... <laughs> Back on topic, what is a creature collection property without creatures? And while I do like how vague the concept of a friend gets, especially at the end with how exaggerated and just wild the concept can get, I gotta say the effects on most of these creatures are certainly... effects? I couldn't find an exact budget for the film, but I was told that Jellyfish Eyes was made on a very modest budget. And I gotta say, it certainly shows in a lot of ways. I can forgive the CG on some of these creatures, but green screen? What is this, an amateur YouTube video? I bought a green screen and I just use it as a tarp that collects dust because I realized how badly I fucked up. Never buy a green screen. They're not as impressive as you think they are, trust me. But anyway, these creatures, while I like the design of them, I do find Kuragebo to be quite adorable. The way they fight can leave me a little nauseated, at least in the first few fights. They just move and the camera shakes so violently whenever they land a punch. Ugh, it's just awful. But thankfully, when the anime waifu summon comes in and starts fighting, it just becomes a full-blown anime. 
it's so strange and wacky and thrilling, and I forgot that this is a Criterion film. What the fuck? This is a... Uh, this is certainly the strangest thing they've slapped their name onto when you look at this scene out of context. However, my favorite of these friends isn't any of the creatures shown in their low CG glory, but Luxor, this massive creature that is just a giant costume. I like practical effects. I'm a simple man. I'm not going to shit on CG artists because that's also something that takes time and effort even on a budget like this, but you can't beat a giant fluffy dog costume like this. Come on. There's even some friends on the menu screen that I don't think was in the film, or at least not that I could see, and they just look silly. This one looks like the character from Little Big Planet got royally fucking torn asunder. This one looks like he ate everything in Grandma's medicine cabinet. I like this one, though. He has a face that tells me he's got things figured out. They weren't always CG, though. Behind the scenes, they were made with clay and had to be kept on model throughout which only makes the jump to CG more confusing in all honesty. I guess making clay dolls move with real actors was just more of a pain and they needed something physical for the kids to interact with. But even still, it's a shame that they didn't get used in the film itself. I gotta say, I love everything about this from a visual standpoint. Not just the effects and the designs of the creatures, but also these nice shots of the countryside. There's nothing like Japanese farm towns. They really have this nice vibrant glow to them in movies. I think playing Persona 4 and walking around Inaba with the fields and the power lines in the distance helped convey to me that that was a style I liked a lot. And I think the music is really nice too. There's a lot of impactful tunes throughout and some nice, soft, cheerful music. There's even a song in this film by Hatsune Miku. Aw oh, man, this really is like the mid-2000s again. Where's my cum-encrusted Misato body pillow and my half-drank sake? Let's play that song right now. <laughs> Boy, that was some good auto-tune. However, while I think the spectacle and the presentation of the film is good, the story and the characters leave a lot to be desired for me. I really wish we got more wacky live-action stuff like this, but I just wish that the ones that we do have were... good? Stuff like Giver Dark Hero and PG Psycho Goreman. One had a lot of really slow moments with awful human characters mixed with some great hardcore action and violence, and the other was so close to being a perfect homage, if not for the annoying main child characters. Thankfully, Jellyfish Eyes doesn't have any characters I outright hate. I just don't find the characters particularly interesting or care about them one way or another. I mean, they're fine, they do stuff. They don't really do much for me to like them. They just kind of cry and fight and have fun with their friends and also have fun with their human friends. But they move the story along, I guess, so I can't be too uh, upset. I can just be very, very apathetic, though. Really, the interesting stuff happens around these kids rather than with the kids themselves. Like, this gang of hooded villains here are just so damn comical. Look at these fucking nerds. They really walk around like this fucking everywhere. It's so cringeworthy and I'm loving it. It was the perfect ironic villain. But no, they just had to go and blow it up. You and your stupid plans and your gay ass Hot Topic jackets. These guys just had to pull a super dumb plan out of thin air. Uh, spoilers from here on out, but... They summon a giant friend that will take the misery of Japan and destroy the entire country, and that's their way of saving it. Literally, Seymour Guado from Final Fantasy X shit. To save everyone, I must kill everyone type shit. So fucking nonsensical and dumb. Fuck off. But even still, while I can't really find myself too invested in the human characters, the world building is what gets me interested. It's not that it's super well written, but it has enough mystery to it that gets me curious. The friends are clearly a strange, otherworldly, almost alien presence that is summoned from some other place to alleviate the misery of these kids that they're enduring, with stuff like parental abuse, parental neglect, having a dead parent, having no parents, or your parents are part of a cult. And let's talk about that. There's the secret society that is trying to harvest the energy from these friends. And then there is a cult that talks about how the country has failed them. How they are being led by God to salvation. And, you know, the typical cult mentality fucking gobbledygook nonsense that is fucking stupid. 
And the thing is that Jellyfish Eyes came to Murakami after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster, an event that had massive ramifications on Japan and around the world. I was just 12 when the event happened, and I still remember hearing how bad it was on the news and in school for a while. And there are brief mentions of that throughout the film. The kid's dead dad dying in a tsunami, the cult talking about it, even some mention of a horrible calamity by the secret society. I feel that this movie is really trying to do more than make fun of Pokemon and Murakami's usual mockery of consumerism method, or that kids are cruel, but that there is a sense of hope in the darkest moments. The ignorance of the children to the greater scheme of things can lead them to do really messed up stuff because they don't understand how much pain they can cause, but it is also that innocence that helps them find comfort in something like-minded that wants to help them. There's just a desire to want to connect with someone, to feel love and comfort in the darkest of moments. Now, do I think the film conveyed that message accurately? I mean, it certainly tried. And if a dumbass like me could figure that out, then I guess it succeeded. But of course, Murakami is an anime man. And what would a movie be without a, having a grand final battle with a giant monster with the entire school banding together with their friends to fight to the very end? It's literally like every other anime movie ever. It's like Pokemon the first movie, but with a less stupid ending. But I gotta say that the two scenes that really made this ending for me was the boy screaming at the top of his lungs as he's getting brain drained. <laughs> and the girl getting whipped by a rail. I am fully aware that I am a sick individual. I do not care. This is funny to me. But at the end of the day, the kids win. They reunite with their beloved friends. And the film plays us out with Hatsune Miku. In case you forgot, this was from 2013. I think I like this film. It's definitely a weird one. And it's most definitely one with a lot of problems. It's super convoluted for a film made for children. It's doing so much and saying so much while keeping it vague, and I don't know how much kids will get into that, and the human characters are super one-note and not interesting at all. I guess kids just want to see the cute creatures on the screen fighting, and that's fine, I suppose, but when Pokemon is still reigning supreme, long before this film came out and long after this film came out, which was 10 years ago, dear God, I don't know if they'll sit through this or just ask to play Pokemon instead. But, having said that, I still found the film to be quite entertaining. Maybe it's the vague commentary on childhood, Japanese culture, and trying to find hope in the worst situations. Or maybe it was just the batshit insanity, especially at the end. Or maybe it was the weird creature designs. But this film just did it for me in certain ways. And it was certainly a film made out of passion by Murakami. He's been trying for years to get a sequel made. It's currently cancelled as of the time of this video, but he's hoping to have it out one day. But still, we gotta ask the question, and I think I now better understand it having finished the film. What the fuck is this doing on the Criterion Collection? Criterion, the biggest film nerds around, and I mean that with respect, they have always had many strange films that they've preserved. Stuff like Black Moon, Naked Lunch, I just finished a video where I had to watch Pink Flamingos, but even still, I get why those movies are on there. They challenge the notion of what films can do, what they can show, what they can say, and what they can mean. So what makes Jellyfish Eye so different? What makes it so alien compared to everything else? Is it the tone? It's a weird comedy with strange creatures. Well, that can't be because they have a whole series of films about strange creatures. It's called Godzilla, but that movie has history to it. Godzilla is a household name. Okay, well, they also have Terry Gilliam's Jabberwocky, which is a weird comedy film with strange creatures. Is it because it's a children's film? Because as we all know, children are stupid and can't understand movies because they're just so dense and dumb. Uh, can't be that either because Criterion also has Wally. Yes, the Pixar film Wally. -E. It's on the Criterion. Maybe it's just because the premise is so bizarre and so out there that it doesn't feel like their usual track record. 
And you know what? That's probably true. But there's one movie that I dare say is the same in that regard. Alex Cox's Repo Man. Repo Man is a strange, bizarre, counterculture film that some would also label as debatably not good. But people love Repo Man. They worship the ground Repo Man walks on. And I am one of those people. I adore this movie. And I adore it because it is different. Jellyfish Eyes is also strange. And it just does what it wants to regardless of what others think. And while I don't know if I love the film like I would say Repo Man, I can safely say that I respect it for doing what it wants to do. As I've stated before, what really contests as the worst film on Criterion is up for debate, but if Jellyfish Eyes is their worst, that just goes to show what they have in their preservation and how good it really is. Jellyfish Eyes may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I can safely say that I personally get jellyfish eyes and yes it was better than armageddon sorry not sorry k bye <laughs>